All right, time for video four. One, I, what I think is probably one of the most interesting of our videos in this first uh, unit in bio uh, biology and chemistry of life. Uh, chemical reactions and their uh, important counterpart, enzymes. Um, now, don't let this title frighten you. Chemical reactions implies chemistry. Oh, no. Oh, I didn't do well in chemistry. Very, very simple. It's going to build upon uh, what we covered in our third video, organic macromolecules. I think carbs, lipids, proteins, etc. So what we want to do is start off very simply with defining what is a chemical reaction uh, and then looking at what they need um, in order to occur most of the time in living organisms, enzymes which actually, uh, to make another plug for our last video, is all they are are specialized, specific proteins. So, let, so uh, let's look at, uh, to define this, and let's do it two ways here. We'll, we'll actually uh, look at the very, very nerdy way uh, up here, the nerdy definition, and down here a little more uh, simplified uh, definition. So up here, this idea of breaking bonds in reactants, uh, to form new products and form new bonds, which is kind of crazy. Now, if, uh, just a quick example. If you think of, remember from last video, our idea of, of carbohydrates, uh, we could have large, complex carbohydrates that were made up of a bunch of single monosaccharides, uh, let's say a glucose stuck to a glucose stuck to a glucose here. And what this is saying is that we can actually break uh, these little bonds that are holding them together right here and right here and then reform these products into something else new. So if we were to break them apart, uh, that notice changes the molecule into smaller uh, compounds. So again, that sounds a little bit nerdy, but uh, if we look down here at the bottom, I really like this definition because it's it's simplified. It's saying really all we're going to do is change something into something totally different, uh, and um, in outside of our cells, in in all living cells, this is going to occur because this is remember one of our characteristics of life. For example, obtaining and using energy, we need to do this uh, to grow and develop. We need to do this to respond to our environment. We need to do this to reproduce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a, a key step. Uh, to the life process. Uh, so uh, now what do we mean really quickly by reactants and products to look at that? Uh, very simply put, reactants are what you are starting off with in the beginning. They are what are going to enter into a reaction while on the opposite end are products, just as the name implies, that's what gets produced, what gets made. So let's look at a couple of examples of, of pretty simplified chemical reactions. Uh, that may or may not occur in cells. Some of them don't, some of them do. Uh, and try to identify the reactants and the products. So uh, one unfortunate thing here in this uh, PowerPoint awesome software um, is that it doesn't allow me in the, the when typing these to do subscripts. So this should actually be written as CO2, the little 2 implying that there are two oxygens there, plus H2O, we know what that is. And now this arrow here means, anytime you see this arrow, that means chemical reaction. And what we're getting at here is that uh, this is actually carbonic acid, which is sounds nasty. It is an acid here. So we can take carbon dioxide, can react with water to form this acid. This really means this term, again, reaction. Or another way to say that our reactants here turn into our product. Uh, and in this, notice we're taking two smaller reactants and building a slightly larger product. We can also go the other way. We could have this carbonic acid break down and turn into carbon dioxide and water as well. So chemical reactions can occur in both directions, which is very, very important to note. Uh, also, in the next one, we can see these uh, this H2, uh, this is hydrogen gas plus O2, oxygen water, uh, excuse me, oxygen gas yields water. And then even, oh my gosh, what is this mess? Don't worry about this. This is uh, naming this, and again, without doing these subscripts, it's kind of difficult. But essentially, what we're doing here is mixing uh, vinegar, acetic acid, with sodium hydroxide, which is baking soda. And we get, if you've ever done that, you get a bubbling, kind of slightly violent reaction, and it yields uh, some precipitate, it yields water, and yields bubbles, carbon dioxide. So all of these, essentially, to the left 
side of the arrow are the reactants, to the right side where the arrow is pointing are the products. Now, uh, there are actually, really quickly before we look at enzymes, which are going to drive these, there actually are two kinds of reactions that occur in cells and in living things. Uh, and they have slightly nerdy terms, but we'll look at some examples here. Exothermic. Uh, exo meaning outside, thermic, thermal, temperature. And these will actually release heat and release energy, more importantly. Now, if that sounds a little bit uh, confusing to you, a simpler way to think of that essentially is what we're doing is we're taking a larger reactant and breaking it down into smaller products. Uh, kind of an, a better way to, to, to think of that. The opposite reaction would be endo, inside thermic, uh, and that's where the, we'll actually be absorbing heat and energy and kind of storing that away. In essence, we're building larger molecules. We're taking two smaller uh, reactants, or two or more, and joining them together to get a larger product. So uh, a couple of quick examples up here. Here is our exothermic. Uh, and again, these don't worry about yet, yet at this point. In a few minutes, we'll look at enzymes and substrates. But here's our reactant. We're grabbing onto that, and we're breaking chemical bonds, literally breaking this guy uh, and changing it, changing its shape, changing its properties, and spitting out two smaller products. That's exothermic. Endothermic, you can see, is, is exactly the opposite. We're taking two smaller reactants, uh, locking them together. Here's our chemical reaction occurring, just as it occurs up here, and spitting out a product that, notice, is a little bit different. Different shape, it's larger, it has some different chemical properties, so we're storing energy here. All chemical reactions in your body, in your cells, and all living things fall under either exothermic or endothermic. Uh, so again, exothermic really, really quickly, as we said, breaking starch into glucose. Remember from our third video, this is a huge macromolecule, a huge carbohydrate made up of a bunch of glucose molecules. And uh, what essentially this graph looks a little nerdy, but we're breaking that down. We're actually releasing energy. The products have lower, smaller amounts of energy. And in an endothermic, the opposite, uh, building glucose from smaller molecules. Uh, we'll look at that later on when we get to ecology, uh, how you uh, actually can manufacture larger ones. So we're taking smaller reactants and building a larger molecule. Um, but the most important part here that we want to focus on for the remaining aspect of the video is there's a downside to this, and that is in our cells, chemical reactions will not just happen. Think about that. If we took a, uh, if you were to eat a, uh, say a Snickers, a candy bar, uh, and die, we say you digest that, you break that down. That would be a chemical reaction. Your uh, organs and tissues and cells can digest that, break it down, turn it into smaller molecules, and ultimately turn it into energy. Uh, but if you were just to take a Snickers bar and set it out on the counter, it's not going to break down. It will not undergo a chemical reaction. We need what is called a catalyst. And all that means to catalyze is really is to speed something up to make something happen. And we're lucky. In our cells, we have proteins. Remember we said in our last video, they're the, probably the most important organic compound. It's what we're made up of. It's what really drives everything in us. These proteins are called enzymes. They're our workers. They're, they're the uh, molecules that are going to make these chemical reactions occur. And all they do, we'll look at how in a second, they speed up these reactions. They're going to grab onto reactants and, and make force the reaction to happen. They're very, 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 very important. Uh, so the one term that we need to get down really, really important is the idea of substrate. Uh, this is a fancy way for saying reactants. Uh, so if we look at this a simplified form, here's our uh, a reactant. Uh, and this is our enzyme. Now notice, these are just cartoon images here, but notice something very, very uh, interesting, really important here, is that the substrate, notice, fits in perfectly inside, if you will, inside of that enzyme. Uh, they match up, and the area where they lock together is called our active site active site because that's where the action is going to happen. So if we were breaking down starch, for example, in your spit, in your saliva, you have a very important enzyme called amylase, and its job is to break down starch. So if, uh, with that in mind, if we were to use that as a, a simplified example, uh, this could be our enzyme amylase, uh, this could be our starch molecule, 
And what it does is it grabs onto the starch. Notice they fit together perfectly here at our active site. And then once they join together, we'll get a chemical reaction. It'll break that starch down into smaller molecules. So anytime you see the word, uh, as we said, substrate, it just means reactants. Uh, and again, after the chemical reaction, the products get produced. So looking at another cartoon example, here's our enzyme, here's our substrate. They join together at the active site, and that is where our chemical reaction occurs. And it releases and spits out products. Now, two things that are very, very important to notice here, extremely important, we cannot stress enough. And that is, notice when it releases the products, our enzyme here did not get used up. Nothing happened to it. It didn't change its shape. It didn't change its size. It wasn't broken down. And think about what that means. What can this enzyme now go and do? It can go and grab onto another substrate and do the job over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, which is kind of nice so we can reuse them. Very, very important. And the other aspect we want to look at is down here is our time. Look at how quickly this occurs. At time one second, 1 1.000, look at how fast this occurs. Two thousandths of a second it took for that reaction to occur. So these enzymes not only cause the reaction to happen, they cause it to happen very, very quickly, which is important because <laughs> we need these reactions in order to live. Super, super important. Uh, and one uh, uh, very important thing that you probably have already picked up on here as we wrap up, think of a lock and a key. If you have on a keychain five keys, each of these keys only works on one specific lock. In other words, my house key cannot unlock the doors to my truck, and it will not start my truck. The key to the room here in our science classroom will not unlock the front doors of the school. And the reason for that is shape. So enzymes and substrates are just like a lock and a key. Remember that uh, aspect. And then we want to end with, <laughs> there's always a problem, everything. The enzymes are pretty weak. Uh, they're super important. They're super amazing, super effective. But they're weak, and they can be prevented from working very, very easily by a lot of environmental things. Temperature can alter and affect enzymes. Uh, salt and things called ion concentrations. If there's too much or too little salt, that can affect them. Uh, acids and bases. Uh, if we start changing the pH, altering that. Remember our aspect of homeostasis. We don't want these things to change. Uh, we want to maintain a constant internal environment. Um, and even other molecules can stop them from working. So let's look at really quickly. Uh, how these would happen. And some proof from that, if we look at our graph here, this is a graph showing temperature and how fast our reactions occur. And in this particular example, it's kind of a generic one, notice that the rate of the reaction, the reaction works best at about 40 to 42 degrees Celsius. When the temperature is too low, the reaction doesn't work. The enzyme's prevented from working. When it's too high, it denatures the enzyme. And we'll look at what that is in a second so the reaction doesn't work. So all enzymes have an optimal, the best conditions they work under. Same thing with pH. If the pH gets too uh, low, as we said, um, if, if that were to occur, uh, oops, we'll go back here. Uh, if our pH gets too low, um, and when we say, again, too low, oh, one too far, sorry guys. Uh, when we say, again, <laughs> too low, down here would be acidic, up here would be a base. Notice that enzymes don't work as well. This particular enzyme, whatever it is, works the best at pH 8. So they're very, 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 very particular in how they work. So this is showing us really quickly, we'll wrap up here, this idea of denaturing. Notice that here's our substrate, this yellow block coming in, but we've warped. It's almost like we've melted our enzyme, it was denatured, doesn't work anymore. And that's not a good thing because the chemical reaction will not occur. And the last thing to look at is sometimes other molecules can inhibit and prevent them from working. So here's our normal enzyme. Here's the substrate. Normally that locks in perfectly. It spits out the products. Notice right here, if an extra molecule, something different comes in, it can fill in, block that active site. Our substrate cannot get in there's no chemical reaction. Sometimes drugs and, and medicines will work that way as well.